But the first time I met the king was in 1954. He had a, he came to Dexter and he had a PhD and everybody's a gag. All the teachers, especially people who, uh, well, I never thought that degrees made anybody. I don't now. Nor do I decry them. I believe in education, totally. But uh, King had to come to Birmingham to speak to some, I don't, I don't know what it was, was it teachers or fraternity or sorority, I don't know what it was. But the whole time was a gag with him coming. And uh, when he got to Birmingham, he wanted to meet me. Because I was the one that's pushing up dust in Birmingham. And he came over. He was, came was late then. He should have been to me, <laughs> but he's always late. Lateness was a part of his life. Looked like. Um, he came over and we, we didn't talk that long because he had to go, but he just wanted to meet me. And he, we were talking about, uh, he didn't, he didn't, one of the things that impressed me with him, he wasn't talking about his degree, nor was he talking about philosophy that much. We both agreed that segregation was wrong and that the black population especially had been debilitated by not having opportunity, not being allowed. <clears throat> and uh, we agreed on that. And we agreed that something ought to be done. And that maybe in God's time. And you must remember that the Supreme Court decision had come down. See, that made me feel like I was a man at last, that I had, almost like I had got a new religion. I think it had done it in his life as well. Uh, we were different people. We weren't real close in a sense. Ralph and he were friends, like they lived together. But uh, I respected him because he was against segregation. And I could work with anybody who believed segregation was wrong. Do you uh, sometimes get disturbed at uh, the perception that some people have that, I mean, the whole movement centered around Dr. King, whereas you were, in fact, doing, you know, um, leading a movement before Dr. King, you know, was even in the area? No, I don't. I'm never envious of what other people have or get. Uh, Positions. I always am hopeful that when you get in a position, feel the position. If you put a little man in a big place and he doesn't see anything, he makes the place little. I'm afraid that's going to happen in our country now. But you can put a, you know, and everybody, most people seek to be big, but bigness to me involves service. Fairness, uh, doing what you know you ought to do, whether or not other people do what they're supposed to do. Uh, I, before you got here today, I was called by one of my co-workers been working in the Southern Organizing Committee, and I was telling her that you're being the leader of this. You can't deal with the skirmishes between people. It's always going to be skirmishes. Everything starts off around something good. Don't you know everybody prays over any organization you find? If it's, a, if, it's, if it's a spitting committee, you need God dedicate this that we might spit right or that we might walk right. But after a while, when the committee gets going or when the program gets going, it becomes less like God and more like us. That's why things fail. I have always tried to speak not my own mind, but uh, in a nice way by mom, because I think people ought to respect what God has done for them. I think Martin was God's spokesman to the country. His task was not mine. I'm a battlefield type general. I lead to the battle. When Martin had to be pushed, he was very slow. He, he agonized, and one of his problems, I thought, was that he hated he hated to uh, hurt people's feelings. 
Now, my mother didn't mind hurting my feelings. You know what I'm talking about. I always explain. And that helped me. And I think sometimes his problems were that. And I'll give you an instance. Uh, well, there are several, but this is one I think is good. Uh, we were in Selma, Alabama, and, and inspiring the people to come to the courthouse, you know. When my CT Vivian was struck by Jim Clark, and they were beating heck out of the young people there, you know. And Martin was in Montgomery. And Bevel, who has brilliant in this with kids, the federal judge said that if you come to get in line, you're going to have to go way back to the end line in the mob. Might be hundreds of people there. And Bevel, which he was right, I guess, in one way. Hell, I don't need no federal judge tell me my right. Blah, 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 blah. We ain't going to, we don't get, but that was a victory then, you see. So Martin had 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 stayed in Montgomery, I believe this was the second night and the third night he asked me to go to seven. And uh I said to him, Now Martin, I know you hate to uh go and overrule Bill, but you're gonna have to. Well, uh, I said, No, 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 ma, I'm telling you. I said, Now I'll go, but I will tell him you'll be there tomorrow night. So he he had to be he had, he had to, to be, be pushed. pushed. And some of the letters I wrote him earlier, they have them. I, I, I was writing that you good speeches don't make good action. And I, but I, I think he grew into what he had to do. I still believe if Martin Raff had come back to Birmingham, we could have helped to solve the problem of integration by getting everybody register for school so people would grow up together. White flight would see everybody can't buy a mortgage, you know, get a mortgage. Mm -hmm. And this just came to me. And I think if if I had to do it all over again, I'd find some way. I guess I would to do that. 